Well, as I was preparing to come to be with you, I was asking the Lord what I should talk about. And the thing he put into my heart was this idea of commitment. Commitment. What does it mean to commit to something? That was the question that was bouncing around in my head. And so I was trying to think, well, how would I express that? What does it mean to really commit to something? And there were a couple little thoughts that came to my mind. One thought that came to my mind is when I commit, there is no graceful way to turn back. You know, when you commit to something, there is no graceful way to turn back. I remember when I was a, a kid in junior high and high school, there used to be these um, uh, times that would happen where a craze would kind of go around the school, and you would be in the lunchroom, and you'd be getting ready to sit down at your chair in the lunchroom, and as you were going to sit down, somebody would sneak behind you and pull the chair out from underneath you. And you would go bang down on the... On, on. Does, is, did it, mean kids only do that upstate, or do they do it down here too? Yeah, they do, they do it everywhere, didn't they? And, uh, the, and, and so they would, they would pull the chair out from underneath you. Now, if you knew this was happening, you would kind of get yourself ready, right? And uh, you would, you would kind of set yourself self up, and, and as you went, you wouldn't just sit on the chair. You would have to slowly go down and make sure the chair was there, right? Because other, somebody was going to pull it out. And, and if they tried to pull it out, you could jump up and go, ha ha, you didn't get me. You know I, 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 you know, I was able to take care of it. But if you came to that point where you were sitting, where you committed yourself to the chair, I am going to give myself to this chair now, right? I'm surrendering to the chair. And that chair was not there. There is no graceful way to come back from that. You are going down. Boom. I was thinking about this idea of commitment. I was thinking there's no balance in commitment, right? Uh, it really doesn't make any sense for somebody to say to you, well, you know, if I said, you know, are you committed? And you say, well, a little. How many of you know you can't be a little committed? You are either in or you are out. You are dedicated or you're not, you're committed or you're not committed. You can't, you can't just be a little committed. It's like being a little pregnant. It just doesn't work out. Okay, you are or you aren't. Uh, commitment is a, a very powerful concept. What you, and a, another thought that came to me was that commitment always costs me something. For 20 years, I was the pastor of a, of a church, and we were like this church. We had multiple services in the morning. And, and uh, it, um, you know, my day would start out like 5.30 in the morning. I'd get up and kind of do a little rehearsal before my sermon and kind of make sure I had it all down in my mind. And, and, and then, you know, we'd have the services that would go on and then the after-service stuff that would happen. I, a lot of times I wouldn't get home till 2 o'clock in the afternoon after everything was all done and all the different activities and meeting with people and things like that had happened. So I was used to being pretty busy on Sunday morning. And, uh, and so finally I came to a point after 20 years, I moved into another aspect of ministry. And this new aspect of ministry that I moved into, I, was, I didn't have any commitments on Sunday morning. You know, I went to church like everybody else did, so I'd go to the early service, and, uh, you know, 10, 15 would, you know, roll around, and I'd look at my wife, and I'd go, well, what do you want to do? You know, I mean, we weren't used to it. You want to go to, you know, you want to go to breakfast, or, you know, go to brunch someplace, or, you know, what do you, you, know, you want to do? And, uh, and so we would, you know, we took advantage of this new adventure time we had. We went and drove around. I was shocked. Have you driven by Lowe's on a Sunday morning? Have you ever gone by Lowe's? Lowe's parking lot is packed on Sunday morning, right? I was just wondering, where's everybody on Sunday morning? Now I know they were at Lowe's. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if I do another church plant, I'm going to do it in the Lowe's parking lot. The thing was absolutely filled with people doing their little projects at home and buying their little stuff tools and things that they want to work on and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, and you know what? This morning, I don't know if you noticed, you're not at Lowe's. Here you are. You, when you came to church, it cost you something. It cost you some freedom, right? You gave up something uh, to be here. I'm so glad you did. I was thinking, though, 
this morning of all the people that have gotten here way before you, right? People setting up stuff out there and the pastors that were here and the music team and the sound team and all the different people that were involved. Let's give a hand to all the people who gave some time today. They were committed, right? They were committed uh, to make things happen. I mean, it's, it's just so powerful. Well, those were some of the thoughts that came to my mind when I thought about commitment. But I think what we're all really interested in is what does the Bible say about commitment? So I'm going to talk to you about a passage, 10 verses from the Gospel of Luke, that people have struggled with over the years because they're so powerful. Um, You know, one thing about Jesus is he does not have a man-pleasing bone in his body. And he's not political at all. Jesus never took a poll to see how, which way the crowd was going and try to align himself with them so he could be popular. As a matter of fact, sometimes he said some things that if I was there with him, I probably would have put my arm around his shoulder and said, Jesus, this is not the right thing to be saying if you're trying to build a little action here. right? We're trying to get something together here, and you are saying some things that I think are putting people off a little bit. And this is one of those passages. As a matter of fact, one verse in this passage is so radical that I probably would say we need to just edit this verse right out because nobody is going to understand this. This is like totally whacked. And that's the way Jesus is. So let's, well, let's hear what he had to say about commitment, okay? So this is what we're looking at. Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 25, and we're looking what Jesus has to say on the subject of commitment. Now, great multitudes were going along with him And he turned and said to them, listen to this now. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't know about you, Pastor Vic, but that doesn't even sound right to me. It doesn't even sound like Jesus, right? Jesus is supposed to be, I mean, isn't he pro-family, right? Doesn't he, you know, isn't he, you know, doesn't he want me loving my wife? What is this about, right? What's happening? But Jesus just, he just, he doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care what I think. You know, I, I can't take it out. There it is. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is trying to point something out to us here. It's a very, very important principle that there are, that, 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 In the world of relationships, he demands preeminence. He says, I have to be number one. Every other relationship in your life has, has to be below your relationship with me. That's got to be the number one thing. And he, he speaks about the most intimate human relationships that we have right here in this passage. And he says, I realize these things are powerful, but I want you to understand something. They need to be below me. As a matter of fact, what I've discovered is that there are some relationships that simply don't work when they get out of order. If you allow the relationships, as a matter of fact, the Bible is filled with stories of people who love their children more than they love God. And when that that thing happens, that distortion takes place, the people become ineffective at parenting. They become ineffective at at doing their job. I, I mean... If you've been a parent for a period of time, you have probably have had an encounter like this one, right? So your child comes home from school. Hey, Dad, Dad, guess what? What? We're having the most awesome party this weekend. It's going to be fantastic. Really? Where's it going to be? It's going to be at Billy's house. His parents are not here, but they said we can use the house. And, uh, Dad, it's just awesome. We're all going to be there. And it's, it's like an entrepreneurial thing for kids. It's like we are doing this party ourselves. Okay. I like to, always like to see you growing in responsibility and things like that. But what adults are going to be there? Oh, no, adults. This is us doing this. 
Every kid in school is going to be there. It's going to be the greatest thing ever. Well, honey, I hear you, but I don't think you can go to that party. What? I have to be able to go to this party. What are you saying? Honey, I don't, I don't feel comfortable sending you to a party where there are not adults that are... Do- you know, you have to, Dad, Dad, if I don't go to this party, I might as well not even go back to school. Everybody is going to be there. Well, honey, everybody may be there, but I don't think you're going to be there. What are you saying about me? I don't understand if this house, this house, I hate you. The door slams. Come on, you've been somewhere in that conversation. Either the door slammer or the slammy, you know, I don't know what the right, right, right phrase is. And, and if I love my child more than I love God, I, I make my way to the door and I say, oh, honey, don't, don't be mad at daddy. Uh, we'll do something to make it so you can go. Don't, don't, don't be angry with me. And, instead of me sticking with every gut signal that I have, every sense of moral truth that I know from the Word of God, instead of me sticking with that, I'm willing to compromise that so that my child is happy. Why? Because I love my child more than I love God. And when I allow that to take place, I stop being an effective parent. Is this making sense to you? And so, so he starts out here and he says, he says you, you, need to be, you, you need to be committed, he says, and the first thing that's got to be committed is your relational life. Every relationship in your life has to be placed under me. And he, he doesn't stop here. Verse 27, he says this, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, when we think of cross, when we hear that word, we think of, Symbols in the front of churches, and we think of crosses on the tops of buildings. We think of cute little teenage girls that have little gold crosses around their neck. And this is what we're, the images we think of when we have that. But you have to realize that none of those images were in the minds of the people that heard Jesus this day. He said, whoever does not carry his own cross. Now, if you were carrying a cross... You were a person of no reputation. You were a convicted criminal that was being led outside the town to be hung upon that cross as a public demonstration of just how off the wall your life was and just how wrong you were. Your reputation was absolutely destroyed. I've been to Jerusalem, and and the old streets of Jerusalem are not much wider than from here to the front row over here, and, and... and if I was there, and, and I looked down the street, and I saw a cohort of Roman soldiers around a man carrying his cross, I would not want to be associated with that, with that in any way. As a matter of fact, I probably would press up against the wall as far as I could to let the, to let the, um, the, the, the soldiers go by. And the last thing I would want to happen would be for the person who was carrying his cross, coming along like that, to look up at me and go, Hi, Mike. Right? I, you know, I want to go, don't say hi, Mike. Why are you, you know, I don't know you. Why are you doing this to me right now? Because, because for him to associate with me makes me him. You know what I mean? It makes, it, it makes me, me of no reputation, see? And Jesus is speaking to us here. He says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, that is, if you're willing to be associated with me, here's Jesus carrying his cross. Now you are joining, you are identifying with him. You are becoming of no reputation, right? People are looking at you and saying, oh, that person, they think these goofy things. You know, they're some kind of religious person, whatever. You're becoming a person of no reputation. Jesus says, look, if you're going to be committed, every relationship of your life has to be submitted to me, and you need to be willing to have your reputation absolutely dragged through the mud in my name. You, 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 you need to be willing to have that happen. And then he's, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about this morning? Commitment, right? And so he goes on from here now, and he, he gives us two, two pictures, two word pictures here, two little stories to help us get the idea that, that this commitment 
needs to be something that we have thought through, we've processed. He says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. We have, uh, there's a, there's something like this near where I live. There's a little lake there, and there used to be a, a restaurant on the lake called the Canisius Inn. And they got involved in rebuilding this restaurant, and through some kind of complications, the whole process got stopped. And there's just an empty steel frame of a building that's been sitting there now for the better part of a decade. Right? They began to build but they were not able to finish. And every time we drive by, my wife and I drive by, we look up at this, at this thing and we go, I wonder if they'll ever finish. You know, it's, all, it's a constant reminder to everybody what happened in this situation. They began to build, but they were not able to finish. He's saying to us, that, listen, don't, this isn't an emotional commitment I'm looking for. It's not, it's not for you to get all excited about something and jump. And he says, I want you to stop and count the cost. And it's so important to him that he reemphasizes it again to us. Now, this is what he says here in verse 31. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks terms of peace. So he, 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 he takes the image and he shakes it up again now and he gives us this image of a king, of a general, and he has an army of 10,000 and there is, there is another coming against him with an army of 20,000. Now, the truth is an army of 10,000 can beat an army of 20,000. But it's not in the realm of what you can see, right? If what you can see, you would go, no, they, you know, they, it's, it's going to be a losing proposition. But if the army of 10,000 is committed, life and death committed, the army of 20,000 can be beaten by an army of 10,000. It's happened all throughout history. Um, if the, it, it, there, there is an unseen thing that's going on in that battle. And so he's saying to them, he's saying, look, he says, Think about it now. What would you be calculating? What would you be thinking if you were going with 10,000 men against an army of 20,000 men? And he's, he's saying, uh, he, he said, you would count this up in your mind. You would say, is it worth it to us? Will we pay the ultimate price? Will we give everything that we've got to do this? He says, otherwise, he says, ask for a delegation to ask terms of peace. Because unless you are committed... There is no way you're going to win that battle. And then in verse 33, he says, So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. So we're talking about relationships. He's talking about reputation. Now here he opens the subject up now, and he talks about another whole dimension of our lives, our possessions. Why is it so important that our possessions be committed to Christ? What many of us don't realize is that every possession has gravity to it. Just like the bodies of planets and different things like that have a gravity, they have a pull to them. In the same way, every possession has a gravity to it. There's a sense in which you own it, but there's also a sense in which it owns you. It commands you. It controls you. I remember the first time I really got a picture of this was as a young married man. My, I had uh, little, little kids in the house, and I told my wife, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the weekend. I'm, I'm no big master builder or anything, but I said, I'm going to take the weekend, and we'll, we'll, we'll put together one of these sets, these swing sets for the kids. That'll be nice in the backyard, you know, put together a swing set. And so I took the weekend, and, and I did everything the instructions told me to do, and I bolted it all together and put it all together. And, and uh, finally, the end of the weekend came, and the swing set was, was done. I was feeling pretty, pretty good about myself until I got to the last page of the instructions. And then I flipped to the last page, and it said this. It said, in one month, 
you need to go back through and retighten bolts A, C, B, 9, you know, and, and the instructor, okay, retighten bolts. I'll put that in my calendar, you know, in a month, that'll, that'll work out. And then it said, in two months, you need to lubricate joint this, 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 you know. Then it said, in three months, you need to go back again and retighten this thing, this thing, this thing, and this thing. I looked at the thing, I looked at my wife, I said, I, bought a, I thought I bought a swing set. I bought a life commitment. <laughs> See, and that's the way it is, isn't it, a lot of times with possessions. You think you're buying the possession, suddenly you realize the possession owns you, right? Uh, I see people walking around with their little dog sometime, and I think that to myself. It sounds like, who's leading who here? Okay, so anyway, um, so, so, here, so we have, the, we, we, we have this, this uh, picture that Jesus is painting for us. He says, every, your, he says every relationship, every, your reputation, your possessions. And then we, we come down to the end of the passage, and these two verses were very confusing to commentators for a long time because they appear to say something incorrect. And, uh, and so it was confusing. How, why would Jesus say this? Because it's not true. They appear to say something untrue. And uh, so let's look at them together, verse 34 and 35. What are we talking about? Commitment. Commitment. Okay. So, so remember now, this whole 10 verses, he's, just t- he's giving us his, his take on commitment. This is what he says in verse 34. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It's useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so here was the problem. It says, when the salt becomes tasteless, it's implying that if I have salt, and I leave it around for a period of time, that something will happen to the salt, that the salt will stop being salty, right? But what we all know is that's not true, right? How many of you know you could take a container of salt, put it up on the shelf, come back a decade later, pull it down, and what is it? Salt. It's still salt. It still tastes like salt, still functions like salt. It's just salt, right? So this did not make any sense to anybody. They were, they were like, what is he, the salt becoming tasteless? What is he... What is he talking about? The salt never becomes tasteless. You never, you never hear somebody, you know, sit at the table and shake out the salt and go, oh, yeah, that salt's gone bad. Oh, yeah, check the expiration on the bottom of that, baby. Yeah, get, get, the, get the fresh salt. You know, you, you never hear that because the salt never becomes tasteless. It just doesn't happen, see? So what was Jesus talking about? This is what threw everybody off. What is, what's going on here? And until they did some study of the times, they didn't quite get it. So here's, here is what they came to discover. Now, salt was a very precious commodity at this time. With salt, it had, had medicinal qualities to it. You could do things with it that way. Uh, salt had preserving qualities to it. So, you know, we all know salt seasons food, that kind of thing. So, so salt was, um, was a very valuable commodity. And if I was a person who marketed salt, and I had a container of salt, there was a thought that would come to my mind, and the thought would be this. If I could put something in this salt that looked like salt, but wasn't salt, not a lot, just 10%, just cut this by 10%, I would make an instant 10% 10% profit on this already valuable commodity, and nobody I sold it to would know any of the difference. Because let's be honest, if you have 10 grains of salt that you think is salt, and one of them isn't, so you have nine grains that are salt, who is going to go, oh, well, this isn't salty like I remember it? You know what I mean? You're, they're not going to do that. They're going to go, this is fine. This, is, you know, this, just, this works just perfect. And so what would happen is the people who marketed the salt would cut it. They would put in a mixture of something that looked like salt, but it wasn't salt, and they would cut the salt. So this was fine, and if it had only happened one time, it would be it would have probably been okay. But what would happen is every time the salt would change hands, I would buy the salt now. I would bring it home and I would say, well, you know, I want my salt to last longer and all this kind of stuff. And what would a difference of one grain of salt be? So I'm going to cut my salt by 10%. 
and nobody's going to know the difference anyway. My stupid teenagers won't use it all. You know, it'll, it'll, it, it'll work out okay. Nobody's going to know the, you know, anything. And so I would cut the salt. And every time the salt changed hands, people would get the bright idea that they could make it, let it last a little longer, be a little better, and they would cut it. They would compromise it. And every time they did that, right, over time, there would come a day where someone would take the salt, they would shake it out, and they would go, you know, this doesn't even taste salty at all. I don't, I, because the cutting had happened so many times that there wasn't, any, there wasn't enough salt in there to make it happen. Jesus says, if that happens, it's useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what is salt? Salt is the attitude in this story of total commitment. Salt is the attitude of salt. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. Now, God's commitment to me never changes. God, you know, while I was yet a sinner, the Bible says, God loved me. That's crazy, isn't it? When I didn't even care about him, when I wasn't interested in him in any kind of way, he loved me completely, totally, so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. It was never dependent on me in any kind of way. It was a gift from God. And, and, and so he, he loved me. So God is committed to me completely, eternally, awesomely. He's given over to me. But I am not the same as God. I have, a, I have commitment issues in my life. Let me say it another way and see if you can, you can picture this. How many of you think that a five-year-old can give their life to Christ? Okay, well, a few of you lifted your hands up. I think some of you are afraid to lift your hands. You think I'm going to catch you. But, okay, let me ask you this question. How many of you think a 10-year-old can give their lives to Christ? That is, they can give their life to Christ and make a commitment. And most of us in the room are, uh, believe a 10-year-old can do that. Okay, so let's say we have a 10-year-old. They've made a really wholehearted, complete commitment of their 10-year-old life to Jesus Christ. It's, they have a genuine, authentic salvation experience. Beautiful, powerful, wonderful. When that 10-year-old becomes a 16-year-old, how many of you know they may need to recommit themselves? Why is that? Because the world of a 10-year-old and the world of a 16-year-old are very different worlds, aren't they? There are all kinds of new opportunities. There are all kinds of new temptations. There are all kinds of new things that happen between the 10-year-old and the 16-year-old. So that 16-year-old, even though the commitment they made at 10, year old, 10 years old was authentic, complete, wholehearted, over that six years, their, their world has changed completely. And so that when they find themselves as a 16-year-old, they might very well find themselves saying, you know what, I need to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. Okay. And how many of you know that a 16-year-old, when they become 21-year-old, are you with me? that the commitment they made at 16 may not be quite enough to carry them at 21 because the world that they live in at 21 is a completely different world than they lived in before, and now they have new temptations, they have new opportunities, the world is different, and so at 21 they find themselves again at the altar going, I just want to recommit myself to Christ. Are you, are you following me? Are you with me? So what I want you to see is this. It doesn't mean that what happened in the past was inauthentic. It doesn't mean that it was unreal. It's just that the normal course of life, the changing environment we live in, the changes we are experiencing ourselves, all of these different things work to cut the salt until finally we can find ourselves in a position where the salt has become tasteless for us. I know people who are in church, they show up every Sunday, they come, but it's been a long time since they felt the thrill of, of wholehearted commitment. 
because they found a nice, satisfying place of compromise that they have made for themselves, and they're, they're in a nice, comfortable little world, and they're not being stretched in any kind of a way. And, and somehow they come to church, but it really isn't a very passion-filled experience for them. It's, it's grown cold. The salt has become tasteless for them. And the only way it can be restored is with a fresh commitment. Let me give you another picture of this. So I'm at a new season of life when, my, when I'm younger. I'm thinking of myself at the beginning of my working career. And, and uh, uh, I'm married. I have a, a little child uh, at this time, early, 19, early 80s. And... and um, and, and, and I have, I've, I've just gone out and bought my first new car. And the reason I can afford this new car is the job I have is the kind of job where I travel and they pay me money for the mileage I have to put on the car. So I sit with my wife, I said, you know, they're going to pay us for the travel that I do. So I think that will make the car payment for us because we couldn't conceive how we would be able to do a car payment. And so we went out and bought a new car. Now, a new car for us, for me in particular, was a very big deal. I had grown up in the inner city of Utica, New York. I grew up in a single-parent home with my mom. I'm quite sure my mom had no idea how to drive a car. No, no idea how to drive a car. Uh, you know, if we wanted to go anywhere, you took the cab, you took the bus. That was how you got around. You know, cars, that was like something other people had. You'd see them go down the street and stuff like that, but you didn't ever yourself have a car. That was like... That was like so far beyond. But here I was now with a car. You know, kind of done something that new for my family. And I'm feeling pretty good about this. I'm out polishing my car, cleaning my car, making my, you know, this is the car, you know, this nice, I just really think this is special. Well, one day I'm there messing with my car, cleaning the car up. And my little four-year-old, Toby, at the time, uh, he, I don't know, he gets in his mind, he needs to say something to me. And he comes running to me where I am at the car. He's been playing in the driveway and the little rocks and things like that in the driveway. He comes running to me, and as he's just about to get to me, he trips, falls into the side of the car with his little fists filled with pebbles. And then he slowly slides down the car trying to keep himself from falling, he slides down the car. To the... And I'm like, I'm like, ah! 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 You know, and Toby's like, Ooh. I said, Toby, go in the house right now. I want him to go in the house because I don't know what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm lost here now. I'm, go in the house right now. Toby's like, ah! Go in the house. Ah! He runs in the house. I'm standing looking at the car going, I cannot believe it. That, that will never be right again. You know, that is, that is just messed up. And all once the Lord comes to me. He says, well, that was a surprise. I said, well, what was a surprise? He says, that you, to realize that you like the car more than you like your son. I said, What? I said, that is not, I, I said, there is no way I like this car more than I like my son. He said, he said, from what I could see, you like the car more than you like your son. I said, okay, okay, fine. I'm going to give you the car right now. I'm, I'm committing this car to you. I'm give, it's not my car anymore. It's your car. I'm putting it into your hands. But this was much easier to do now that the car was scratched. Be, you know, when it was brand new, I kind of wanted it to be my car. You know what I mean? But now with the scratches down the side, I, I, I offer it to the Lord. Okay? And, and so, so what's happening? What is the story I'm describing to you? What's happening is this. I'm at a new phase of life that has new opportunities, has new temptations, new things. I, I never before had to worry about loving a car or a possession more than loving God. I never owned anything. I, you know, that was, had any worth or value. So, so, he, so here, the first time in my life, I'm facing a whole new thing, a whole new experience. And so what's happening is my, my commitment, see, 
And he's, the Lord's coming to me, and he's, he's cashing in the check I, I, I gave to him at the very beginning. And he's saying, he's saying, you said all your possessions. You said you would give all your reputation. You said you, you, you would give all your relationships. You would, put it all, you would give it all to me. Right? And so I come to a new place of surrender. And this happens over and over again in life. It happens uh, with romance, you know, Mr. Right or Miss Right. And, and, you know, sometimes we can let them rise to a level that they shouldn't be at. It can happen with career where, you know, you're away at a convention and, you're, and all, once all the people you're working with are all going out partying and, and you don't really feel comfortable with doing that, but you're thinking they're going to all think you're some kind of jerk if you don't go and, and you're, 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 you're torn there. It can happen with your children. You know, some of us, we face this battle of giving our children to the Lord, our grandchildren. I was quite irritated with God. I had given my children to the Lord, but he just took my grandchildren, right? When my son Toby that I was telling you about decided he wanted to become a missionary to China, he left and he took the grandkids with him. Imagine the nerve. Took my grandkids with him to, to China and was a missionary there for, for many years. Now, now, this happens all throughout life, right? I can remember when my kids were little, I would want to, I just wanted to stir them up in their commitment to the Lord, you know, their, their, their following of the Lord. And I would tell them stories, sometimes stories from church history. Uh, one group I would talk to them about was the Moravians. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Moravians before, but uh, it was a church group in history found in the, the Netherlands in, in that area. And they were an amazing group. The, the Moravians uh, started a prayer meeting. This is, this is a church history fact. They started a prayer meeting that lasted for one Hundred years, 24 hours a day, every day of the week for 100 years. Wow, it's right. That is like, holy smokes. I can't even, I mean, we're talking about people were born and died before the prayer meeting was over. You thought you had a long prayer meeting, you know what I mean? It, I mean, it, for 100 years this thing went on. And these people were so passionate about God that they, 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 they love the Lord, and you know, the thing that happens when you love the Lord is you end up loving what he loves. And, and what does God love? He loves lost people. And so they, 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 they had this tremendous heart for the lost. It was so strong that at one point in their history, there were two of their leaders, uh, one guy was a potter, the other was a carpenter, that they wanted to preach the gospel to the West Indies, the slaves of the West Indies, people who had been taken there in slavery, they wanted to preach the gospel to them, but they had no way of getting the resources to make it to the West Indies. And so these two men decided to sell themselves into slavery so that they could be taken to the West Indies so that they could preach the gospel. Uh, a very powerful image. And it, as the story is told, they, they were on the ship getting ready to leave the harbor, and their church had come to say goodbye to them. And, and as they looked from the the deck of the ship down to their friends, they knew what was in everybody's mind. And the question that was in everybody's mind was, was why would you do something like this? Why would you leave your job? Why would you leave your parents? Why would you leave the romance possibilities? Why would you, leave, why would you do something like this? Eh? And as the ship began to pull away from the harbor, these two men standing on the deck screamed out words that have been turned into hymns and turned into, you know, all kinds of things, poems and all kinds of stuff. And the words that they cried out from the deck of the ship was this. They said, to win for the Lamb the reward of his suffering. This is why we do this. To win for the Lamb the reward of his suffering. I would tell stories like this to my kids. You gotta be careful the stories you tell because my kids grew up and two of them ended up being missionaries. One of them in China, but both of them ended up in China at some point. They were gone for a long time. I remember particularly Toby and his wife, Michaela, and our three grandchildren had been away from us. They were on and off there for 15 years, but they were away from us for about a three year period. And we were so excited when we got a letter that came to us, and they said, we're going we're gonna to come home for five weeks. 
And it's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be during the summer, and they had some weddings they needed to go to and things. And we were just so excited. And they came home, and they brought our little grandchildren. You know, uh, uh, the oldest was about five, and then three, and, and, uh, and then, then I think it was like one, one-year-old. And so we had the, the grandchildren. We, we had them back. And then their brothers and sisters heard about it. Their, they had one brother and one sister. They, all, they came back with their families. And just so that we could all be together for this five weeks. And so we just had the grandest five weeks. We did all kinds of, went to parks and, and did, had all kinds of cookouts at the house. We just had the most fun. And it was down, coming down to the end of the five weeks. It was the Sunday before the Tuesday that they were going to leave. And we said, uh, we said, well, let's have a little, you know, we'll have a little cookout at the house. And so we had this great cookout going on. And it was all going great until the end of the evening was coming. This was not goodbye. This was just a cookout. Tuesday was goodbye, right? Where it's, this is Sunday. But my son Todd and his family, Todd gets up at one point in the evening. As the evening is getting ready to end. And he gets up and he says, hey, Toby, he says, I'm traveling on business this week. I can't be there for you to say goodbye to you and everybody on Tuesday. So this is goodbye for us. This was like a total shock. Nobody was ready for this. And he walks over and he gives Toby a hug. So Toby hugs him back and he starts crying. And Todd starts crying. And I start crying. And then the wives all start crying. And then everybody is, the brother and sister, okay, everybody's crying. We're I just, we were, it's like sobbing, you know. You know, they're crying and hugging and all this kind of stuff. Finally, they all leave the house. I'm sitting in my chair in the living room. My wife is there. I look at my wife. I say, there is no way I can go on Tuesday and say goodbye. I can't go through that again. I said, I am emotionally completely depleted. I, there is no way I can go on Tuesday. I, I had this picture in my mind. My, my little granddaughter, Maya, she looked like, little, she looked like uh, Shirley Temple, little Goldilocks, little curly hair, blonde. And, and she was older than the other two. And she knew that they were going to be going away from Grandpa and Grandpa, who had been treating her like the princess of the universe for five weeks, right? And I just had this image of them going through security and, 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 and little Maya looking back at me going, Grandpa, Grandpa, don't let them take me! And I thought, that's all that's got to happen. I'm done. You know, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll totally break down. I can't do it. And, and so, so, uh, so it comes to that Tuesday morning. My wife, who is much more of a grown-up than me, goes to say goodbye. I'm at... I'm at, at uh, at, the home, at home, I'm sitting in my chair and thinking about them as they're getting ready to get on the plane. All once my phone buzzes, and I look down, and I have a text. And this is what the text says. It's from my son, Toby. He says, about to leave for Shanghai. And then he says, why do we do this again? Question mark. And then it goes, oh, yeah, dot, dot, dot. To win for the Lamb. The reward of his suffering. I love you, Dad, he says. To win for the Lamb, the reward of his suffering. And he repeats back to me the stories I used to tell him as a little boy to remind me on why we do what we do. To win for the Lamb, the reward of his suffering. Now listen, you're sitting here right now. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're being dealt with about, I don't know the things that are happening, but I have a suspicion, right, that maybe the Lord is trying to beckon you to a fresh commitment. It's not that what you did in the past was not good or it wasn't sincere or it wasn't real. It's just not what's needed today. Today requires another level of commitment because you're facing new opportunities and you're facing new temptations, and you, 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 there, there's something more that God is, is calling for from you. Just bow your heads. Would you right now before the Lord, and just bow your heads and your hearts just right there. Oh, Spirit of God. You know, as you've 
as you've been listening to me, and I know how it is at church, you know, sometimes you're at church, and, you know, it's church. It's, it's, it's great. It's awesome. But occasionally there are those times where the Holy Spirit is prodding you somehow. He's poking you in some way. He's trying to disturb you from the gentle slumber that you have found yourself in. And I wonder this morning if that's what the Spirit is doing for you. And he's calling you to a fresh commitment. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just today, it's just not enough for today. And as you're, as you're sitting here right now, I don't know what you're battling with, whether it's children, grandchildren, health issues, career issues, retirement issues. But the reality is that it's a new day and it requires a new commitment. And if you sense the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning in this way, and you want to offer yourself afresh to him, you want to count the cost and give yourself over to him as a totally committed disciple. I want you just to lift both of your hands right where you are right now. You sense, you sense the Spirit prodding you this morning, that there's a, a fresh commitment that needs to take place. A fresh commitment all around the room. Our loved ones here are lifting their hands. A fresh commitment right now. I want to give myself a fresh. I want to give myself a fresh to the Lord. Lord, I just ask right now, his hands are lifted in humble surrender all around this place right now. That there would be an offering of ourselves to you. Lord, we don't want to be that tasteless salt. Uh, we don't want to have so compromised away uh, the flavor. Lord, we want to be freshened right now, revitalized. Uh, and I just ask you by your Holy Spirit, as hands are lifted right now, that you would come and seal these commitments that people are making, that a powerful spiritual thing will be taking place in heart after heart after heart after heart, Lord. A fresh surrender. A fresh commitment to you. I know you have wonderful new things you're wanting to do in this area, and you're wanting to use these people as your seeds. And yesterday just simply isn't enough yesterday's commitment. Today, it's a fresh thing that you're doing. Lord, I just ask you to seal all of these fresh commitments, fresh consecrations all around the room right now. Just seal them in, Jesus, and cause it to be so clear. People already have in their minds tons of different areas where they've just kind of made little compromises, and they're, and they're going, no, I'm going to turn my I'm turning my back on this. Like me with the car, making a fresh surrender. Lord, that they, there will be fresh surrenders all over this church right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.